Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the sixth and final presentation in our Protecting Indigenous Cultural Heritage uh, programs and speaker series that's, that's funded by the SFU president in the Dream Colloquium series. I'm George Nicholas of the Archaeology Department at SFU and director of the IPINCH project. Um, I would like to begin by asking my, my colleague, Dr. Rudy Reimer from First Nation Studies uh, at SFU, Yumsk, and also his, his uh, cousin, Hetzelem, uh, Dustin Rivers, to, to provide a welcome for us. Tanoi up, see I Tanoi up on Sequetals Hearts and Squawins, Quins Quatch, no me up, eighty squire teat seats. Jin Quinman told me up, Quis Heme, eight teat seats. Chit O told me up, T West Emo, a scopish oath, Stalmo. Name it to scope me stomach. Nice old to me. A chin corn man told me up. Tim are tight to my quetzy, Koyan's nature. Honored guests, respected people, it's an honor to be here this evening on our traditional territory, Skoomush Tameil, uh, that we uh, live and dwell on with other Coast Salish First Nations. This evening is a special event, and I'm very honored to be here with you to stand beside uh, my cousin, Hetzilam, uh, my family. <coughs> and translate <laughs> into English uh, what this high-standing young man has just said to you was a, a welcoming. Uh, we hold our hands up to you uh, for being here this evening, but also to welcome a very honored guest. And the work, <coughs> the ears and our eyes, our thoughts this evening should be of good mind. And so I'd like to thank George, SFU, for asking us to do this, to follow traditional protocol and to, to respect our ways. But my uh, cousin and I, we'd like to uh, give a, to honor our guests. And for us as indigenous people, as First Nations people here in Canada, one of the highest ways we could do this, to acknowledge someone as a Siam, someone respected as a leader, as a front runner that continues throughout their life to influence in a good way for other people to look up to. And typically the way we do this is with one of these. In our language, this comes from a bird a high, that soars high in the sky, close to the Creator. And we have uh, the word for this bird is Spockwus, or many of you probably know it as Eagle. And so I'd like to present this to you, Linda, on behalf of my cousin and our community and on behalf of Indigenous people. It's a great honor to have you here this evening. You can clap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rudy and Hebsalem. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. John Driver, Vice President of Research at Simon Fraser University. 
Thanks, George, and uh, thanks, Dustin and Rudy, for that, uh, that very warm welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome everybody uh, to the 2015 President's Dream Colloquium titled Protecting Ind Indigenous Cultural Heritage, Emergent Policy and Practice. This is the uh, sixth and final lecture in this series, and we're very honored today to be hosting Linda Tuiwai Smith as SFU's Monroe Lecturer for 2015. The Monroe Lecture uh, is a special lecture. It's a public lecture that's held at the Vancouver campus, uh, and it honors Jock Monroe, uh, who is an economist and was senior administrator at SFU, serving three terms as vice president academic. And Jock's sitting over there, probably too modest to wave at everybody, but there he goes. Welcome, Jock. Um, the Dream Colloquium was launched by President Andrew Patter in 2012 to create a forum for interdisciplinary engagement across uh, the university. This spring, uh, we've actually offered two colloquia. We, we actually run a competition, and, and both colloquia were, were so good that we decided to do both of them this, this semester. Uh, and the second of these is entitled Obedience and Disobedience, Taking Action on Climate Change. And this has been running in alternating weeks uh, from, from the uh, series that we're at right now. A total of 30 students from different disciplines are enrolled for credit in these two colloquia, where they have opportunities to not only learn from instructors and guest speakers, but also from each other as they share insights that, they've, uh, that they bring from their different uh, departments and disciplines. Here's a quote from a, a previous student in the Dream Colloquium from a couple of years ago. Uh, the student said, uh, it's like a field school without having to leave campus. We have the chance to learn in a completely different environment, tackle monstrous issues, and have remarkable discussions with bright people from seemingly unrelated disciplines. By fostering interdisciplinary dialogue, nurturing advanced research, and promoting a supportive learning environment, the President's Colloquium reflects SFU's vision to be an engaged university defined by its dynamic integration of innovative education, cutting-edge research, and far-reaching community engagement. I'm very pleased to say that there's been a tremendous response from the university community to both the colloquia lecture series. Uh, and as you can see, looking around the room tonight, we're pretty much full. Uh, and in fact, this uh, lecture is being webcast as well to reach an even uh, larger audience. Now, the theme of protecting cultural, uh, indigenous cultural heritage uh, is particularly relevant to SFU, uh, given that community-based research and knowledge mobilization are central to our vision as an engaged university. That vision calls on us to build respectful and mutually beneficial community relationships aimed at enhancing the social, economic, environmental, and cultural well-being of communities both locally and globally. Uh, our vision also holds respect for Aboriginal peoples and cultures as one of its six underlying principles. Dr. George Nicholas and the researchers, the many researchers with whom he is associated, are really at the forefront of emergent policy and practice in protecting indigenous heritage. Last year, Dr. Nicholas's project, the Intellectual Property Issues in, in Cultural Heritage Project, known as IPINCH, uh, became the first recipient ever of the very prestigious Social Sciences and Humanities Council Partnership Award for Research Impact. Professor Nicholas and his team have since led workshops on community-based research uh, together with SFU's Office of Research Ethics, and earlier this year they hosted a National Research Ethics Conference in Vancouver. So thanks, uh, George, and your team for your efforts uh, and uh, your contributions to this important series. Uh, thank you also to Gladys Wee from the Graduate Studies Office for organizing the fourth President's Dream Colloquium. It takes a lot of work to get all this done, uh, and we appreciate the, the help that the Graduate Studies Office provides. Now, I know that, like me, you're probably more interested in, uh, in hearing from our speaker tonight, uh, so I will ask George to introduce Professor uh, Linda Smith. Thank you. As the organizer of the speaker series, I had essentially my choice of inviting the best scholars, practitioners, and, and others involved in the realm of protecting heritage. And there was no question that one of those slots was, of course, to invite Dr. Linda Tehewis Smith of the University of Waikato in Hamilton, New, New Zealand. There are two ways of introducing Professor Smith. 
And this is the first. <laughs> Decolonizing methodologies, research and indigenous peoples. And I think many of you, if not most of you, are familiar with this. And I could probably just sit right down and leave it at that. And what is so important about this volume is that it changed the discourse. It forced us, it forced researchers and others around the world to shift their thinking from research on indigenous peoples to research with, for, and by indigenous peoples. And that really marked a sea change, and we're still surfing on those waves that Linda and, and others have, have generated. There is, of course, the second way to uh, introduce Professor Smith and to reveal to you some of her other no less impressive credentials. To begin with, she is Professor of Education in Maori Development and Pro Vice Chancellor Maori and Dean of the School of Maori Pacific Development and Director of the Te, Ko uh, the Te Kotahi uh, Research Institute. Uh, all of which are at the University of Wakato in New Zealand. For decades, uh, Dr. Smith has worked in the field of Maori education and health as both an educator and a researcher. She's published widely in journals and, and various books, and of course her book, Decolon Decolonizing Methodologies, um, is one of the most widely cited volumes in this realm today. It was recently reprinted in a new edition in, in 2012. And just to give you a sense of the scope of the impact of this volume, it has been cited, according to Google Scholar, 8,300 times so far. And that list, that numbers are, are constantly growing. Dr. Smith was a founding director, or founding joint director of New Zealand's Maori Center for uh, Research Education or research excellence, rather, from 2002 to 2007, and a professor of education at the University of Auckland. And as a personal note, I had the opportunity to, to meet Linda there when I was in sabbatical in Auckland in, in 1996. And our conversation then uh, has left a lasting impression on me that has proven inspirational and uh, provided guidance in my work in the realm of indigenous archaeology ever since. Professor Smith is a member of New Zealand's Health Research Council and the Morrison Council Council, chair of the Maori uh, Health Research Committee, president of the New Zealand Association for Research and Education, and convener of the Social Sciences Assessment Panel. She was recently appointed to the Constitutional Advisory Panel in New Zealand and to the High Panel for Science, Technology, and Innovation for Development in Paris. Despite administrative obligations, Dr. Smith is principal investigator um, on the, in, on the, in the pursuit of the possible indigenous well-being project, an international comparative study of the conditions, strategies, catalysts, and meanings of, this, of the um, meanings that indigenous peoples employ to realize their aspirations for well-being. While many of the key elements for social transformations of, are, of course, well known at this point, um, the real trick is to develop the means to address those aspirations and to help indigenous peoples achieve and retain well-being in, the, in their lives. And that is at the, at the core of this, this very innovative international project. In 2013, Professor Smith was made a companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to Maori and to education. Please join, join me in welcoming Professor Linda Tehewis Smith. Uh, tuatahi tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, he mihi uh, ki ngā tāngata whenua, uh, ngā tāngata Coastal Salish, uh, ki a koutou, ki a rātou tēnā, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, ki a koutou ko tai mai i tēnei pō, uh, tēnā koutou. Greetings to all of you. And my first greetings to the peoples, the First Peoples and First Nations, of this territory, and I'm very honoured to be able to stand on the unceded coastal Salish territory. Um, I want to acknowledge Rudy, and you're welcome. Thank you very much. 
um, and acknowledge all of you who've come out on a rainy evening. Uh, this is a new phenomenon for me, talking in the round. Uh, it's going to really restrict my style because usually I move around. Um, so let's see how we go. Um, I do want to thank, um, well I guess I must thank the SFU President's Office for funding George's project. Um, and it is through that project, the President's Dream Colloquium on Protecting Indigenous Cultural Heritage, Emergent Policy and Practice, that brings me here this evening. Uh, thank you, Vice President uh, John Driver, um, and thank you also to, I'm just going to guess you're an emeritus professor, uh, Jock Munro. I'm very honoured to speak a lecture named after you. Thank you. And of course, my um, absolute thanks go to George, who's been a great host. Um, I feel a little bit embarrassed because all I brought with me to give him was a good bottle of New Zealand Pinot Noir. Uh, perhaps I should have brought a few other things as well. So I've got about 10,000 things I would like to talk to you about, um, but I know that's impossible. And so I'm going to break it down into four or five um, topics that I want to cover over the course of this evening. Uh, firstly, though, let me do another introduction to myself that's not the formal academic one, but it is the one that grounds me in what I do and who I believe I am. Uh, and it's important for those of you who are members of the public and, you know, who maybe don't think about research and are not engaged in research to, you might be asking, who is this woman? Um, why is she interested in such a topic as Indigenous research? Um, so I come from two different tribes in New Zealand. Uh, in our context, it is all about your genealogies. That's how you claim your identity. Both my tribes are on the north, on the eastern coast of the North Island. One is kind of close to townships, but one of them, and probably the one that I've spent most of my time in as a child, is in a very remote area of New Zealand. And that is a plus and it is also a minus. These days you still cannot get cell phone coverage, and there's kind of a new haka in uh, my area with people going like this, <laughs> waving their cell phones from very strange places all around um, the community, trying to get a signal. It is a remote place. Uh, but I come from those places. All right, I come from those places. My grandmothers, my aunties, my cousins, my uncles, and that's the indigenous place. Those are the indigenous places I speak from. And those are the places that I carry with me when I travel to other indigenous contexts as I am here this evening. So I have some caveats that I always go through before I give a talk. Um, one of those is that I do speak from a particular context of Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I do not want to come here and be seen to be talking for the experiences of First Nations people here. I think First Nations people are perfectly capable of voicing their own stories. Indigenous peoples internationally share common histories, but have experienced those in vastly different ways. I think one of the challenging but great things about working in indig Indigenous studies is the diversity of Indigenous peoples. Um, indigenous peoples in the countries of Canada, Australia, the United States and New Zealand have some other things in common. Our countries did not rush to sign the Declaration of Indigenous Peoples, but rather ha hung back for many years while they considered whether they wanted to sign the United Nations Declaration. And you might think, why is that? Why did our countries sit back 
and wait for others to sign that declaration. And I think the fact that they did that says something quite deep about the type of experience um, that Indigenous peoples have had in those places. Okay, so let me aim. So, although I do research, you're not going to get a single graph, any numbers, any charts in this presentation. What I want to do, not that I'm saying they're not important, <laughs> but really what I want to do firstly is just kind of unsettle any ideas you might have about thinking about research and thinking of, um, you know, what is this uh, decolonizing methodologies about? So this is a photo I took in northern Sweden, obviously in a Sami community, and I'm the photographer. I think that's pretty amazing, you know, a photograph from me, um, because those reindeer are moving fairly quickly. And what I found compelling about being in that pen with the reindeer is how silent they were, how quiet. And they just go round, they were being um, sorted out for uh, going into winter pastures. Now, that's often um, you know, a common picture of an, an indigenous kind of Sami. You know, she's wearing her Sami costume and she's close to reindeers. And so we can have a stereotype about Indigenous peoples. But you know, the one in the centre, she has a PhD, right? She's a researcher, grew up in Sweden and heads a research institute in Norway. And she owns a reindeer herd. But the reason I choose this photo is not for that. I choose this photo to say that what we're talking about here is dynamic. It's about change. It's not about stability and certainty. It's about movement and development and about uncertainty. And so I don't have all the answers tonight. I never have had all the answers. I think those are things we all explore. So this is another interesting kind of image around research. I often use this to talk about the kind of embedded nature of humans and the environment. Because in many indigenous uh, philosophies of knowledge, when we're thinking about the human subject, the human subject has an important role in nature, but not a superior role. The human subject is part of nature. The human subject has relationships and responsibilities in nature. These happen to be my grandsons playing in a tree. Um, but it's, it's a fabulous image for thinking about what, our, what are our obligations to nature? How do we work in with nature? How do we understand our roles and relationships? So as a social science researcher, you know, I work in the field mostly of education, development and health and well-being. We often don't pull back from the sorts of research we do and ask these deeper, uh, more philosophical questions about why we do what we do or what is the nature of the characters that we're dealing with in research. What are the kind of paradigms that we're bringing to our understanding of the communities we describe? What, is the, what are the forms of knowledge that we're using that begin to put language and terms and definitions around what we see and what we describe? And how good is our language? I mean, I ask that in a kind of, as a, as a writer, you know, who struggles for words often. How good is my language to describe just that scene? Because often I feel it is inadequate uh, to describe something dynamic and deep and relational. And part of our journey is about finding the language, 
finding the language that we can use to talk about what we can see and what we experience and what we feel. And I am related to those feet. Um, I'm the grandmother of the little feet and the mother of the big pair of feet. Um, and I use the slide really to talk about relationships and the embedded nature of relationships in Indigenous research. And to have you think about you know, your own work, the things that you're studying. And we often don't use words like intimacy in research. But if you are engaged with communities and people, you have and form intimate relationships. And even if it's for a moment, I mean, I, you know, one of the privileges of being a teacher, for example, is I get to mess with everybody's minds. Don't you think that's like awesomely powerful? But the responsibility that comes with that is also awesomely heavy. And how do we kind of understand our responsibilities in relationships, in these intimate relationships? Because sometimes in research, we know more about a family or more about a person than they themselves can articulate. We know things about a person that they can't share with their own families or with their own communities. We get insights into their world that they have allowed us to visit. They don't see or well, they don't necessarily understand how much we see from a glimpse. All right? And this struck home to me when I was a very young researcher visiting the homes of families that I was interviewing. And really, you know, you're trained to observe. You can walk into a room, you can scan a room, you can see photos, you can see the way things are organised, you can make an assessment about the material wealth of a home, you can make assessments about relationships in the home, and that's in within a minute. You can do that. And so, you know, often we're walking in and out of people's lives with a great deal of knowledge about them. And they've given us permission to see some part of their life not the whole that we actually do get to see. And I think that is a huge responsibility. All right. So I want to uh, spend some time now talking about the decolonizing um, message, if you like, of decolonizing methodologies and what that's been about. Um, for those of you who've read the first edition, you, you will know in a sense that what I focused on was methodology, was method. And that says a lot about where I was at as a writer when I began writing the book, which was in the late 1980s. And I was trying to make sense as a master's student of the research that some feminist educators were wanting me to do. And I really struggled with the reading, I struggled with the texts, I struggled with the, the ways in which researchers were defined. So it represents partly my journey. And what I did was started with methods and started with methodologies and then moved on to ethics and then moved on to the culture of research and then, moved, then asked questions about the way we're trained and the role that our disciplines have in disciplining our minds, in disciplining our language, so that we see what a discipline allows us to see and we learn to ignore what a discipline ignores. And while that was really important, I also have learned, you know, over time, that research is a larger institution, and I've become much more interested in the institution of research. Um, you, you would have noted from George's introduction, I sit on a number of funding bodies, I sit on governance bodies, I, 
I see how researchers work behind the scenes. I read peer review reviews of journal articles and reviews of research. And so I get a kind of have a a larger sense of the world of research as a system of power. And it is an awesome power uh, in the research environment in terms of how resources flow, in terms of how researchers can mobilise in particular ways to garner resources uh, for their particular paradigm. But you know, my interest isn't really just in knowing that world. That would be pointless. My interest really was in trying to make space for an indigenous way of understanding the world. And what I learnt, and you know, before I even went to university, is I grew up in a home that appreciated knowledge. I grew up in a home that discussed knowledge. I grew up in a home in which literacy and reading were important. And so it came as a bit of a shock to meet people who thought that my people had no knowledge, who believed that somehow my people couldn't create knowledge, that somehow we accidentally got in a canoe drift with men and women and drifted across the Pacific and landed in New Zealand by accident. Now, how do you explain that? You know... You know, so when I went to university, all those sorts of um, attitudes that I sat in class and learned, they made me angry. They made my generation angry. They made the five Māori who were in history angry. And so we would have our own tutorial, all five of us, in the student cafeteria. Um, that it just seemed that the way in New Zealand, not only our history was being told, um, but the way our people were being positioned as ignorant and having no knowledge and not being able to create knowledge, that was just fundamentally wrong. And so my work really has been about trying to make space for an indigenous agency uh, as creators of knowledge that we created knowledge, that we used knowledge, that we had theories of knowledge, that we contested that, those theories of knowledge, that we learnt new things. And that for me, my ancestors travelling across the Pacific, navigating the Pacific, was an amazing feat of knowledge and research and skill and technical knowledge and risk-taking. And who knows how many other canoes set off across the Pacific and didn't make it. What we do know from our oral histories is many canoes travelled the Pacific Ocean, navigated by the stars, read the waves, read the movement of fishes in the waters, and arrived in New Zealand and that that is a feat and an accomplishment of knowledge. And all Indigenous peoples can talk to their accomplishments that are based on knowledge and on creating knowledge and on applying knowledge and on testing the boundaries of knowledge. So my journey in terms of the thinking through decolonising methodologies you know, started out about questioning methods. So some of you who are students are probably at that stage. And it's not like, what method do I select? Is, is there, does my question actually invite a method at all? Is there, is a method possible? Um, and I think that still remains an important question. But now when I teach, I would pull right back from method, all right? So to me, it doesn't matter yet what the method is. What does matter is a few steps back in terms of why do you think the question you have is a good question? And a few steps back from that is what is the approach you think you want to take? And why do you think that approach is important? And a few steps back from that even is how am I prepared as a researcher to work in this area 
Am I good enough? Not am I skilled enough, but am I good enough as a researcher to be working in this area? So, you know, I, I do put a lot of work into having students really think about what it is they think they're trying to do and implicitly what their theories of knowledge are. So I don't know how many of you have started out thinking you might interview elders. That's usually quite a good starting place uh, in our system. You know, your first research project, I'll go and interview an elder. Probably one of the trickiest human beings you could ever interview is an elder. I'm not speaking about here, but I know my elders. They can, they can play you like a ukulele. They're not the easiest uh, interviews, but why that fascination? All right, so every year, new students, I want to interview my grandmother, I want to interview our elder. There's something really powerful about that drive um, because that would not be my personal first port of call is to start out interviewing an elder. My preference is they interview someone in their own peer group. But this drive to talk to elders um, is a very important, if you like, indigenous method. It's an important natural way in which people think you go for knowledge. So in our community, when you're asking, where is knowledge? How do you find this indigenous knowledge? Where do you go to look? The fact that they want to go to an elder says a lot about what a community believes about the location of knowledge and who has it and what their status is in a community and what you have to do to go and get that knowledge. All right, so just kind of um, looking at this um, set of slides coming up, you might have noticed, because every New Zealander would notice this picture, we're New Zealanders. It's probably the best example of what it means to be marginalised that I can find in my collection of slides. We're like nearly tipping off the blackboard. Can you see us? You know, there's Australia there down the bottom and there were, there's this little right on the edge. And that was the geography curriculum of the native school system in New Zealand. Uh, this whole repositioning of the world and of geography and of where the centre of the world is and what mattered in the world. And you will see um, the pedagogy of the teacher, he's got a long, sharp sort of ruler, and that's what he taught um, that generation. My father's generation were taught that, and I was taught that geography. That's not the geography that we use in our language. Here's another um, interesting slide. This is my father in the 1950s teaching Māori language. So by 1950, the Māori language was already dying. It had already um, become a language that could be sort of captured and taught as a formal subject in school. And many of you will know that um, Māori have had the last 30 years of language revitalization on trying to save our language. One of the advantages, well, there are two advantages we've had. One is one language. The Māori language is one language. There are tribal variations and idioms, but it is essentially one language. The second advantage is it was written down, was given an orthography, and was written down very early uh, when missionaries arrived. So many of the early missionaries in New Zealand actually spoke Māori. And they came to the conclusion that it was easier to convert Māori through the Māori language than to try and teach them English. Uh, and I know that story is not repeated 
in other countries. So by the 1970s, uh, our language was in such a state that uh, a protest was organised, a land march or a uh, language march uh, from the north, top of the North Island down to Wellington to highlight um, the importance of Māori language to Māori people. Even now, it is the one subject matter where you can get most Māori agreeing. The Māori language is important and we love our language. And so this uh, period of time was really what then uh, developed into the Māori Language Act in which Māori became the official language of New Zealand. There was no act that made English official because English was the dominant language of the country. All right, so the reason I wanted to show you those three slides is what I'm going to talk to now is beginning thinking through Indigenous knowledge and thinking through what it means to reclaim, to revitalise, to regenerate and to reconstruct knowledge. Because clearly language for us has been an important project that has now helped us revitalise many aspects of our culture. So I know in other situations um, it's often very provocative when Māori people will say things like, to have Māori knowledge, you have to have Māori language. To have Māori identity, you have to have Māori language, because that's not the experience of other Indigenous contexts. But it is our experience uh, that the language, knowledge and culture are tied together and that we have to understand all three components um, if that is to impact on our identity. Alright, so this um, here is my nephew and my two grandchildren. And one of the um, great revitalisation stories of, for the Pacific has actually been the revitalisation of ocean-going waka. So voyaging waka um, created, I think, the, the navigator who helped reconstruct this knowledge in modern times was from Micronesia. Uh, many of the early technologies, if you like, for the revitalisation came out of Hawaii. And now there's a whole tradition of communities across the Pacific setting off on ocean-going waka. I'm going to come back to the story later. But this is my um, nephew who's a teacher in a Māori language immersion school who teaches boys um, to build waka. And that's his strategy for engaging them in education. And I think uh, the boys are getting their tickets. They have to get uh, harbour tickets in order for them to sail in the harbour. And once that happens, they'll be able to set off and sail. 25 years ago, that probably was not imagined. All right? When we started out language revitalisation as a group of activists, we did not say, right, we're going to revitalise our language and then we're going to re-navigate the Pacific. All right? That was not the dream. We didn't know what it would look like. We just thought, well, we'll revitalise our language and then we'll be able to talk in two, two languages. And we'll be just as noisy in Māori as we are in English. And we'll be able to talk, read, write, sing. Right, that was what our aspiration was. But what it has done is actually opened up forms of cultural knowledge that were beyond our imagination at the time. And I think that's a really important point I want to make about revitalisation of cultures, is we don't know where that takes us. We don't know what it helps recover. We can anticipate and we believe that it's a good thing to do and that it will recover good things. But no one anticipated 
that the revitalization of our language would lead to a range of old knowledge being brought back to life and lived again uh, by our communities. So here's another example. I've recently been uh, in Christchurch at a national festival of performing arts. 45 groups from all around the country, uh, the winners of their regions, who come and are, who are so competitive. Like, we're a collaborative people, but when a competition comes up, we like, we are totally competitive. This is one of the most competitive competitions I know of. It just beats research competitions hands down. It's a winner-take-all prize. And what is the prize? Mana. No money, a small little statue. The prize is to win, to be the champion team. And, you know, once again, this has come out of our language revitalization movements. And I was talking to um, George earlier about how exciting this last competition was because of the political discourse that was embedded in the compositions. Um, that we're developing the ability to use our language as a form of critique of things that are happening in our world. Now many of you will know the haka, which is often performed by men and is translated into English as a war dance. It is a, it is a performance of provocation, um, but it is also a political discourse. It is also an expression of what makes us angry, of what uh, disturbs us, of what worries us. And so this last festival, which was about three weeks ago, you know, many of the haka were about contemporary issues in our world. And we we're expressing in the Māori language the... Um, activities or events or trends that were disturbing people. And there was a huge debate because one of those critiques was against Māori television. So we have a television channel um, and the critique in the haka was about this TV channel and the way it was using uh, kind of mainstream journalism to continue to provide negative images of Māori people. And so what the haka said is, aren't you a Māori television? Shouldn't you be telling Māori stories that are positive? Otherwise, why do you exist? Because we've got other TV channels that can do the negative stuff. What's your contribution? If it's just more negativity, well, maybe you should disappear. So Māori Television had the licence to live stream all these performances and they took that haka off air, which caused a social media storm and in 48 hours they had to put it back on. And that 48 hours was a really, to me, kind of inspiring use of social media for Māori political critique, and in a way that was incredibly effective. Okay, so I'm going to tell a couple of stories here really about research and about Māori research, Indigenous research, and, and perhaps what our priorities might be. So those of you in the anthropology world might know the story of the Mātātua Whareinui. So that Farinui in the back there, in other words, that big carved house, was first, uh, it was carved in the 1870s. And it was then borrowed by the Crown, who took it to a number of exhibitions. So firstly, they took it to Sydney, where they turned the carvings, which are our ancestors, they, they turned them all inside out so that the carvings would be on the outside of the house, not the inside of the house. 
Then they thought that was good, they'll take it to the Melbourne Exhibition, then the Victoria and Albert Museum Expedition, then the South Kensington Museum, and finally it came back to New Zealand, to the Otago Museum. And our tribe wanted this whare this building, these carvings repatriated from the Otago Museum back to our tribe. Some interesting discussions went on. So firstly, we had to prove it was our house. Even though it was established, it was carved by us, opened by us, and borrowed by the Crown. But the onus of proof was that we had to establish that case. We had to establish that the Crown took it to all these places and disrespected it. You know, and they would have thought, oh, it's pragmatic to turn the carvings inside out and show them on the outside, and couldn't really understand why we might be offended by having our ancestors facing the wrong way, in the wrong order, and on the outside of a building. But of course, the biggest challenge was to get the house returned from the museum. Now, some of you who've been through this will know that museums at that time, they've changed in New Zealand since this case, had some interesting um, <clears throat> assumptions about Indigenous peoples. So they didn't think they should return this because we wouldn't know how to look after it. They didn't think it should be returned to us because we didn't have conservators. They didn't think it should return to us because we had nowhere to put it. We didn't own a museum. And when they asked what would we do with it, our elders said, oh, we're going to use it as what it was built for. It's a whare nui and we're going to make it live again. And of course that hurt the sensibilities of people who really want, whose idea of preservation is to disconnect it from the people for whom it has meaning. Lock it up in a museum, put conservators on it, enable it to be shown under controlled circumstances, and that's cultural preservation. Whereas our paradigm, if you like, uh, in our world is, if it's a whare nui, let it be a whare nui. If it was designed to be built and to stand tall, let it stand tall. Because if it was just designed to lie flat, to be inside out, our carvers would have carved it that way in the first place. <laughs> but they didn't. So eventually this came back in a treaty settlement in New Zealand. Um, in 1996 and the government as part of that settlement paid uh, compensation for the return of the house and what you see on the outside are modern contemporary carvings and it is part of a living marae or a living complex that is used um, as part of our tribe's kind of cultural tourism ventures. It has a special status as a marae, uh, because in our communities, every community has a marae. We have, every sort of sub-tribe has one of these. Some are little, some are large. And so this has come back as a tribal one, all right? So it's like a national, um, a national marae that we use for major tribal activities. Okay. And so it is um, part of a tourism venture. That's a business team there. Uh, they're trying to develop cultural tourism in our area and the whare nui and other aspects are an important part of that. So once again, you know, business, ecotourism, cultural tourism, those are contemporary initiatives that our tribes are engaging in because they want to develop. We, we could not have imagined this in 1971. 
when we did the Māori language march. Uh, we did not imagine that we would have um, aspirations to, to engage in the tourism industry. Some tribes were already in that industry. Okay, just one more other story. This here is a traditional ocean-going sail that is in the British Museum. It is the only example around um, of a traditional sail. Now you might know that um, you know, our ancestors sailed across the Pacific, but New Zealand has very big rivers. And so the technology changed over time as waka or canoes were built for rivers, not just for oceans. And while we have oral traditions of going backwards and forwards across the Pacific, there came a time when we stopped doing that. Right? It stopped being in our oral histories of the last time we returned across the Pacific. So this sail was made in New Zealand. Um, it was an ocean-going sail. It was, um, you might know from pictures that the wider part is the top of the sail and the narrow part is what's at the bottom. Okay, so I want to tell a little story about this. Obviously the British Museum is not going to give this piece back. Uh, it is rare, it is the only example, and while we would like it back, it's pretty clear that this is not on the agenda at the moment. Um, it's got a very intricate weave. Now, the example, I, the, what I want to use this for is an example around indigenous knowledge, all right, because over the last 20 years that is emerging as a very powerful kind of discourse around traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge, indigenous or traditional ecological knowledge. Um, it has different terms. And many people think that, uh, well, you go and ask an elder and you'll get traditional knowledge. It's a little bit more nuanced in our context because you could ask a an elder and get no knowledge whatsoever. And that's based on their particular experiences uh, in terms of assimilation. Uh, but you can also, you know, some people think, oh, find out about traditional knowledge, we'll go and ask a male elder because they'll know things. Um, and you might think with a sail, you know, me and other ones who sail, that they might know something wrong. That's not necessarily true. Uh, or you think, well, we'll ask a weaver because somebody wove that. And the, pers the people who wove that are most likely to be women. Maybe they know something about the sail. And I guess what I'm pointing out to you is that more and more people are talking about indigenous knowledge as these specialisms. You know, we have weavers, they have a knowledge. We have carvers, they have a knowledge. Right. Here's a team of people here. One of those is a navigator. One of those is a Māori astronomer. One of those is a weaver. And one of those, me, I'm just the organiser. And it took those three people together to figure out how the sail would work. Right, because the weaver understood the patterns, understood how they were made, and had questions about why in some parts of the sail the weave was denser, um, thicker, the, the flax used was coarse, and in other parts of the sail it was delicate. In other parts of the sail there were deliberate holes that were woven. And it took the navigator to say, well, yeah, when you put the sail up, you need these holes to, you know, let the wind through. You need it to be stronger in this part of a sail. So in the course of about three hours that they spent with the sail, um, you know, even the museum staff were excited because the first time they had sort of got a glimpse of how the sail would have worked, why it would have been woven the way it was woven. And I just think it's a really nice example of you know, reconstructing indigenous knowledge out of fragments of knowledge that we have left to us. 
Um, and the reason I say fragments is many of our knowledge holders um, are no longer with us. Many of the people who had the expertise have died. Uh, we don't sail uh, using traditional flax weaving um, anymore, although we do have weavers. And it takes a lot of putting back together again of what our knowledge might have been and what was needed. And in a way, when it all comes back together again, everyone goes, of course, you know, of course, that makes sense. Of course, it took a community to build a waka. Of course, it took a community to make a sail. Of course, it took a community to sail across the Pacific. You know, and that's what it takes to kind of reconstruct indigenous knowledge not the kind of individual pursuit uh, that we kind of had, have adopted from the West. How's my time, George? Okay, it's good. All right, I now just want to kind of move a little bit more into the sort of theory around indigenous knowledges and methodologies. Um, I never thought that I personally would um, sort of start to think and write specifically in the indigenous knowledge space. You know, I've always thought that we've had other resources in our community and that I would leave it to them and I'd just get on with kind of research and methods and writing up good proposals and those sorts of things. But a number of things have annoyed me. And you might have heard me sort of mention those. All right, so the things that annoy me is, one, the way people talk about our knowledge uh, in gendered ways, about knowledge belonging to men and knowledge belonging to women, and that women weave and that men build houses. You know, that um, women do sails, but men build big canoes and sail across the Pacific. I just know that's wrong. Um, but also know it's a kind of a type of privileging that's not helpful when it comes to talking about knowledge. The other thing is increasingly indigenous knowledge is becoming kind of a fashion statement. And there are trends where people are interested in indigenous knowledge. You can go to a conference on indigenous knowledge. And what bothers me about that, and it comes back to the decolonizing methodologies, is that we begin to use the language begin to use the definitions, begin to use the concepts that start to box our knowledge systems up in the same way as if it's just one more discipline in the academy. All right? And, you know, the, some of you might think that's a good idea. We can create a curriculum called Indigenous Knowledge and we can develop research based on that curriculum and we could teach it. And maybe one day that will happen. But I think much more work has to go into thinking about um, what is it we're talking about? What is this thing called indigenous knowledge? I mean, for a start off, it's talked about with about five different terms. Uh, traditional ecological knowledge, traditional knowledge, local community knowledge, indigenous knowledge, um, those are the four common ones. <clears throat> In the international um, instruments of the United Nations, the term traditional knowledge is used. Um, there's a huge literature around traditional ecological knowledge, and many indigenous communities will simply use their own term for what they call knowledge. Uh, the assumption is that this knowledge is a knowledge, all right? It's a describable kind of objective out there knowledge. It's a something that you can look at, understand, it has a, a resource space. In other words, it's like any other kind of knowledge. 
But you will also, if you listen well to how Indigenous elders talk about knowledge, you will also understand there's huge ontological um, elements to it, that knowledge is related as much to being, to identity, as it is to knowing. That it's not, you know, knowledge is not a something that each of us might have equal access to and that each of us might have a right to know that some forms of indigenous knowledge perhaps cannot even come to be known until whoever it is is going to know it has been through all sorts of journeys, uh, walked over hot coals, crawled through a volcano, had and won victories um, against you know, unknown sort of enemies, vanquished them, and then they might have access to the next key to knowledge. So sort of like Game of Thrones, um, but indigenous style. <laughs> that our forms of knowledge, we haven't really done enough theoretical work, I think, conceptual work, on thinking about what we're talking about. Um, but I think there are some things we have done and we can say. When I first went to university and was appalled that my lecturers thought that my people didn't know anything, that we were not creators of knowledge, that we didn't produce anything, that we had no technology. I mean, I sat in tutorials and my fellow classmates um, used to try and convince me that European culture was superior because they introduced electricity to New Zealand. Um, I remember that to this day at university, thinking, what? Um, electricity, you know, is that your measure of knowledge that it's going to be about electricity? Uh, since then, though, I think more and more people are accepting that all peoples create knowledge and have created knowledge. That all peoples produce knowledge. They make it. That all people somewhere in their community have people who think about knowledge. They have intellectuals. They have thinkers. And they honour those thinkers. They give them roles and they give them titles. That all peoples socialise their children into this knowledge. In other words, they educate, they teach, they practice, they learn. And that all peoples have expert practitioners. That is probably the one thing everyone will accept. If you're not a good navigator, well, no one will ever know right? Because you'll never show up again. You'd be like, gone. Not a good navigator. <laughs> but in other par parts of our culture, if you're not good at your craft, you're ex you were expected to stay there until you mastered it. If you were not good at weaving, you had to weave a perfect peace before you could leave it. Unless, like me, you were dismissed very early because you were immediately assessed as going to be incompetent. And then there were nice strategies for saying, my darling, you will never be a weaver. Let's point you over here to somewhere you can be successful. Oh, you can't cook either. Um, <laughs> Okay, we'll send you to university. <laughs> you might be good at something there. Uh, we also know then that knowledge, or accept in the indigenous world, that knowledge is intimately connected to people. And that we need the people to be revitalised for the knowledge to be revitalised. It can't be, it can't come to life in a museum. It can't come to life in a glass case. It can't even come to life in a manuscript. It comes to life when it's reconnected with people. People make knowledge live. 
And that's really important. It's about connecting the two together. All right. Just disappearing over there. Okay, so the next kind of piece I want to talk about, and then I think we'll have time for questions, is there's the decolonising piece, which I think you're going to be expert on, because many of you have told me that you've used that in your, um, in your research. And what I've talked about really is what it has meant to build the Indigenous capability piece. You know, what it means to build Indigenous researchers, to talk about Indigenous knowledge, to revitalise our communities. The bit I don't often talk about is what does it mean for non-Indigenous people to participate in this great project of cultural revitalisation, this great project of Indigenous knowledge, this great project of Indigenous development, and I'm often asked, where do I, as a non-Indigenous person, sit in this work? How can I help? Right, so that's often a question I get asked. How can I help? It's a terrible question. <laughs> All right, don't ever ask that question. All right, because people like me think, that's the, you just want to save us. We don't need saving. We don't need helping to save us, you know, because the implication to us is we need help. So it's, we need a language for talking about not so much how can we help you, how can we work together to achieve some of these things that you want to achieve. What's an agenda we can develop and research where all of us can ask some questions and can help participate in the answers that help to promote indigenous development or indigenous revitalization, or in my current research, indigenous well-being. How can our skills and knowledge be applied that can be useful to you? And that's often a risky question uh, in an Indigenous community where I'm from, because people might say, well, you know, I've got these skills, how can I help? And some smart aleck in my community will get a tea towel out and say, here we go, start there. <laughs> start by washing the dishes and we'll see how skilled you really are. Right? And one might take offence at that, but actually it's a very uh, Māori trick to play because in a kitchen are all the dynamics of working collectively. In a kitchen, everyone needs to do their job without getting in everybody else's way. In a kitchen, there's a clear outcome from the work that you're doing and everyone has to know what that is. In other words, a beautifully set table. The outcome is hospitality and generosity expressed in the best way that our community can do that. So being given the tea towel is not an insult. It's an invitation to come along and participate on this journey where we're all at the end of it going to exercise hospitality that that's the goal of what we're trying to achieve. And I think some of those conversations get, um, or some people have those conversations between non-Indigenous and Indigenous researchers. But often we don't have those conversations, partly because everyone is polite, and yes, we like people to help, and it's nice. So you're not gonna slap someone uh, for being nice. You just go silent and think, okay, what's something that we can give them um, so they don't muck it up or 
what's something we can do together so we can test that the intentions really are good or how can we really involve them. And I think much of the research, and I think I saw that on the website uh, for the Dream Colloquium, has been about building uh, collaborations and understanding the critical work of how do we how do we develop good collaborative work. Uh, and prior to doing that in a research sense, I think it is important as Indigenous and non-Indigenous researchers um, and communities is how do we begin to talk to each other. This is a dialogue centre. Uh, it might be a nice start. But the challenge is we often have quite different languages to talk about each other for a start off. Uh, we have a different kind of set of sensibilities about what might offend us, what might hurt us, what we might fear, what's scary and frightening to us. So many of those topics may not get talked about. And I think great collaborations are based really on very courageous teams of people who do have high and risky conversations. And it doesn't necessarily mean they have arguments and disputes they have courageous conversations because it's only by having those conversations that we can actually develop really solid understandings of what we're talking about. And I'll just give you one simple example. Uh, in the, I know here in Canada and I know at home, one of the principal ethical uh, requirements in research generally, but in indigenous research, is around the three R's right? Respect, relationships, responsibility. And I bet everyone in this room has a view about what respect looks like. So if you were to come to uh, my community and be respectful, and I'm actually dealing with this at the moment with a student, how do you demonstrate respect? Uh, do you take your shoes off at the door? Do you um, sort of initiate a protocol? You bring out the smudge or you bring out a prayer? Do you, you know, what are the, what are the actual steps that we use to demonstrate respect? And I think I bet if I go around the room, everyone will have a slightly different view of how we might even do that. And the student I'm working with at the moment has said, but I'll be respectful. And I've said, you yeah, are all trying to be respectful, but how do you know you're going to be respectful? Well, I'll do this. Well, how do you know that's respectful? Um, yes, most of us take our shoes off when we go into a Māori home. Uh, but I know of an example of an old lady from my community who rang my father up after a student had interviewed her. And she started out by saying to him, now, about your tribal university, because my father started a tribal university, yes. Um, about those students that you teach, yes. What do you teach them? And he was going, so, well, what do you mean? What do you teach them about research? Well, we teach them, you know, he went through the curriculum. All right, do you teach them to have a shower? before they come to my house so they don't smell? Do you teach them to bring a bottle of milk so that they don't drink all my milk and leave me without milk for the weekend? Do you teach them that when they come to my house to do research, they dress up smart and they don't come like they look like my nephew? And my father said, but he is your nephew. <laughs> And she said, today he came to ask me questions. And I think he should dress up and he should smell nice and he should bring some milk because he knows I can't go to the shop on the weekend. Now the old lady taught my father that and the old lady changed our curriculum. 
so that now we have to say to students, or I, you know, we don't have to say to them, but we do sort of casually mention that when you go to people's homes and you go not as a nephew, not as a grandchild, not as an auntie, not as a relation at all, when you go as a researcher, then you need to present as a researcher and you need to think through what that means. So the nephew, of course, thought he was being fabulously respectful because he was going as he ordinarily did. And, you know, when we talked to him later, he said, well, yeah, I rocked up. I always go at this time. She knows who I am. So I did a knock. I walked in. I sat down. I said, Nan, you want a cup of tea? I'll make us a cup of tea. And I had a cup of Milo. That's where he drank all the milk. Um, you know, and so he thought he was being his authentic indigenous nephew self, as indeed he was. But he wasn't being a researcher interviewing an elder in the community. And it was a very important lesson for our students about understanding respect in the form of research and how respect has to be modelled and demonstrated and tested sometimes uh, in particular ways. So even for Indigenous researchers, um, assuming your natural protocols will work in unnatural settings is kind of worth thinking about. Uh, do protocols that you practice in your family work when you want to do some research with your family? Or do you need to create new protocols? So one of my colleagues is into, he loves creating new protocols for new situations. And on a daily basis in our university, there is always a new situation. How do you open a new building? How do you open a building that isn't new but has been redecorated. Do you, do, do you have all these protocols? How do you open a building that's been closed for a few months but is now open again for use? Um, so on any one day in my university, a multiple uh, demands put on our, on our staff normally to come up with an indigenous protocol. And you know, one of my staff ha has had to tell our boss that we don't do dial-up protocols, um, that that's not in our work plan, that we will negotiate a protocol, uh, but we're not going to have staff running across the university to deliver one just because someone rang us up on the phone, that they have to meet with us and we have to negotiate what it is they want. And of course, they see us as a big barrier, all right, because like we're holding up the works, we're not efficient. We should tell them yes or no or get over, get over ourselves. And we're thinking, well, why would you say a chant to open a house in summer when it's winter? We, we don't do that. We need to think about a chant for winter. And actually, it's not really winter, it's autumn. We need to get it right. And who should give this chant? And of course, I know we're just driving everyone around us nuts uh, as we think through these protocols. But that is how we want to live, that it's logical, that it's authentic, that it's meaningful, um, and that we're happy to negotiate with it. And that's where we get our flexibility from. But not that we, you know, people... People ring up. What's the time, George? Time to go. Um, so let me just draw to a close and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, one of the new areas that I'm working on, and I don't like the word post, post anything. So I have to think of an alternative to post. So what I'm working on at the moment is the um, Indigenous peoples after modernity. And so my question is, if the whole definition of Indigenous peoples has been framed by our 
colonisation. It's been framed by imperialism, that our identity is embedded in the project of modernity. Can we have another identity? Or do we disappear? In other words, is modernity the definer of who we are? Given that we predated modernity, you know, we were in our environments being who we were, and modernity came looking for us, or came upon us, or colonised us. And so, you know, the definitions of who are Indigenous peoples, very much one of those definitions is about being colonised, about being a minority uh, in a you know, in, a, in the nation state. It's also about being self-defining, about being able to identify as indigenous peoples. And those are very powerful political definitions that have got us to where we have the Declaration of Indigenous Peoples' Rights. But if we are self-determining and self-defining, what is the next? What is the next piece for us? Or is our identity always grounded in our trauma of colonisation? Is that who we will always be? So that's, that's the question I'm working through at the moment. And I'm working through it at a number of, number of levels, like, is there an after Christianity? I know that's going to upset all my family. Um, in other words, an after, after the missionaries came because missionaries brought us Christianity, but they brought it to us in about 25 different forms, right? And those forms were divisive. So we had this church having these rules, and this church had these rules, and this church had these rules, all of which were actually deliberately designed to keep people fragmented and separated. It had nothing to do with the belief in God or... Um, you know, the value of the Bible, but in the organisation of churches and how they sought to manage uh, indigenous communities. Is there an after colonisation? Or is colonisation our burden to carry forever? That we will always be engaged in the project of decolonisation? of reading colonisation, of interpreting colonisation. So why do I ask those questions? I ask them because when I move around my communities, I see self-defining tribes trying to be something else. Um, you know, one of our tribes, I think where you're from, huge players in, in the industry extreme, you know, becoming more and more wealthy, uh, becoming more and more, not just corporate, but in a sense, building, rebuilding themselves as a nation. And so they're building this kind of sense of nation. And that's a kind of powerful after modernity kind of phenomenon. Can we be actual nations um, and not lots of small wannabe nations? Can we collaborate with each other? Right? What colonialism has done is fractured all our internal relationships, our relationships with our neighbours. Can we be at peace? Can we collaborate around our common concerns? Can we create diverse tribal communities that come under one nation? For places where there are multiple languages, can we agree that some languages will be the language to invest in for the future? Or will we invest in 48 languages and know that their chances of survival, of survival are slim? So that's the work that I'm currently doing. And the, the only other piece that I'm thinking about is, is around nature, the relationship of humans to nature. And every now and again, it sort of piques my interest. 
You know, there's outrage in Australia at the moment with the closing of some communities. Um, and there's a piece that someone has put up about being part of flora and fauna. All right, so when, you know, you know, when um, Cook came to New Zealand, Māori people were classified as part of flora and fauna. And of course, like, we were outraged, because we're humans. Um, don't put us with flora and fauna. And so we've been in the search for humanisation to be recognised as humans. But in our own Indigenous um, knowledge, actually, people... Um, people or humans have these relationships with non-sentient and sentient beings. We have relationships with trees, with birds, with worms, with fishes, with any other sentient and non-sentient element of our environment. We have relationships with stones, with rocks, with inanimate things. And it's a very powerful part of our cosmology, how those relationships in the form of genealogies cre were um, created. So I want to go back and look at some of those questions and say, you know, what is the indigenous, what does indigenous humanity look like? Not what does it mean to be recognised as humans by Western society, but what does it mean to be humans in an indigenous environment? So those are questions for you to ponder. Um, I, I welcome feedback on those, but I know it's time for question and answer, and thank you for your attentiveness. What, what an absolute privilege to be able to share this time, share this space, and for you to share your ideas um, and your knowledge with us. And you know, in, in what you've shared with us, it has been so far reaching and so deep, and what flows from this is this notion that heritage is a living thing. And that research, whether coming from within the communities or flowing from outside of the communities, with indigenous peoples has huge responsibilities because people's lives, their identity, their well-being are at stake. So thank you very much for, for being so generous with, with, with your ideas. We have time for questions. And I would ask that you keep your questions brief and to the point. And um, when I acknowledge you for a question, you will see a button under your microphone and you press it to speak, a red light will come on. So, first question. This is where we get to play. Helson. Testing, there we go. <laughs> uh, tēnā koi. Um, Linda, I want to thank you for, for your work that you do and for being here today. So, and to follow the instructions and be brief, I won't say more than that. Um, my, question is something that I thought about as you were speaking and I feel like you're one of few people that I could probably ask this to. As an indigenous person from my community um, doing work in language revitalization, one of the things that I've come across is the way in which either through colonialism or by design, um, patriarchy has really uh, elevated and prioritized uh, the masculine within knowledge and within knowledge systems within the community. Mm -hmm. And this is evident to me as a language speaker, as a young person, in the way in which our legends are male-centric, the heroes of our stories are men, the names of women in our history are often not recorded or not remembered, but the names of men and the fathers are. And like I said, this is you know, a quandary that we face as young people in our community, whether this is a, a result of colonialism in the way anthropologists had impacted our history and our understanding of history, or by design of our own culture from pre-contact being, uh, unfortunately, uh, patriarchal in its own design. And so I guess my question is, for you and your own work, how you have thought of how to frame this to Indigenous people, um, and also how can we deal with this as Indigenous people when it comes to the work we do want to do in language revitalization, cultural revitalization, or the restoration of Indigenous knowledge? Thank you for thank you for your question. Can you hear me? 
Um, I never thought I would have to revisit issues of gender and race and class because that was my sort of grounding as an undergraduate student was to kind of understand those. But increasingly, I think we do have to revisit um, the, the gendered interpretations of our culture, both from how we um, are trying to live our lives and also how we're trying to represent our lives um, through research and through um, our practices and representations. To, to, in our context, it's, a, it's not really an ongoing um, source of tension from, from the inside. For us, what we see is non-Indigenous people um, always seeking advice, you know, in a sort of gendered way. So if they want expert knowledge, they go and see men. And then if they want to know, you know, what we might do in our homes, um, they might ask women. If you were to ask, for example, who all the Indigenous knowledge experts were, uh, the chances are you would get a, a list of men. And I, I had a project uh, where I did invite a number of Indigenous experts and we deliberately chose, you know, 50% men and 50% women. And it was fascinating what happened because at first all the men talked and all the women sat silent and looked them up and down and I could see in their minds they were asking questions about you know, what does he really know? And then it's, it comes back to my story about the ra, about the sale, is actually the men know half the knowledge and the women know the other half. When you put it together, it's powerful. When you have only part of it, it's partial. And, you know, once they understood that, they had fantastic conversations and, and came to understand that they need each other to talk about um, this knowledge together. But if, you know, what happens, non-Indigenous society, they like, for whatever reasons, maybe that's because they're handsome, they like the men. So they're constantly appointing men to positions as cultural advisors. You know, I'm sort of rare as in, in my role because every other university has a male in this role. And when I was interviewed for my job, you know, I had to make it clear, well, I'm not going to be able to do all the things that uh, the men do. I'm going to do things that I do. And the three men who, elders who interviewed me just nodded and said, yeah, about time. You know, about time that they had women in these jobs. We have different roles and there are times in our culture where that those roles are really, really important and then there are times when they're not important and everyone has to kind of contribute together. So it's a hard answer, but it's a roundabout answer. I think we do need to pay attention to matters of gender. And, but it's not just gender, as I said. It's how we represent ourselves and how we allow ourselves to be represented. I think that's what we pay attention to. Another question, please? Yes. Uh, when you were speaking about if uh, we as Indigenous people are going to be defined by the trauma of our colonization, I thought about how so much of our uh, society uh, in trying to be helpful is uh, seeking, like, cultural competency training mm -hmm. so that they can understand our perspective and perhaps our worldview and you know as somebody who's working in a position to bring about you know systematic change you know whatever that is um, I just don't see this training as good enough I don't see this knowledge of you know, reading an online course or reading a book or going to a workshop as good enough. And yet all of the knowledge that we have in our society today is saying that this is good enough, but I can't grapple with it 
and what you know what advice do you have what a direction do you have for us to take definition the definition of how we should be portrayed how knowledge of our world view and our uh, being is good enough okay just on the cultural competency we have that in New Zealand as well I mean I think from time to time people need a top up of skills but that doesn't replace the need to actually go out and make relationships and learn through relations, through relationships, how to um, work in cross-cultural spaces. Um, you know, and I, I, we, we teach a course ourselves where several of us um, provide advice on, you know, how to how does a big university develop a indigenous strategy? How does it ensure that strategy is implemented? How does it build capability? Now you can have culturally competent non-indigenous staff who will greet you in the Māori language and um, share food with you because that, that's what they've been taught as the competence Right, but does that translate then into um, let's let's develop together um, a great strategy for our university? No, it doesn't. You know, other things have to happen as well. But it, but working cross culturally, it can be scary to people when they first begin. And I, look, I pity any non-Indigenous person trying to work with my communities because we are scary. We go out of our way to be scary. Um, and, and we have a sense of humour about that as well, so we can humiliate people as well. Um, so anyone wanting to work in our community needs some training first, and that gets them in to begin the journey. And it is a journey. Um, you know, how did I learn to engage with non-Indigenous people? I don't even know if I'm good at that. I mean, I might have offended George when he came in 1996. But I've spent my entire life to date trying to engage with the world. Uh, I've spent my entire career in mainstream institutions trying to help those institutions work with my people. I'm at the top of my career in a university and every now and again I have to go and lock myself in my office and swear because I'm obviously not competent enough um, to have the institution really engage. Um, so it's, it's challenging but would I dismiss uh, those cultural competency trainings out of hand? No. I think people need tools I think we always need professional development. Um, I think it's good to have a group of people in a room who, who can talk story, share these stories. Um, I think in the end, people need to be able to think strategically, know which battles you want to fight. You know, you can go through life and a career fighting every other person in your workplace and seeing them all the time as the enemy. But will that make a difference for the next person who comes in the door? That, that's a critical thing. What's the legacy we leave for the next generation? Some fights are worth fighting, and then some, you just, I just hope my daughter's better at it than I am. Um, you know, that other people will come and fight those battles. Question? Yes, please. Tanshi Sesha Adzik. My name is Seisha Adzik, and I'm so honored to be here listening to you speak today, Linda. I've been a huge fan. I've quoted your work many times in my own, and a lot of what you wrote about in your sec I wrote this, read the second edition of um, your book, and it's inspired me in so many ways. Um, and I'm really excited to hear that you have um, a new project that you're working on regarding, um, like, your not post, but after whatever. Um, and one of the things that um, intrigued me was you're talking about uh, is there an after colonization and what does that look like? Um, and my question is, I guess, um, 
how do you see the process of what um, after colonization will look like um, from the eyes of us as indigenous people um, versus the eyes of the non-indigenous society and when we feel ourselves to be in a place of after colonization um, will that also be reflected in the perspective of the non-indigenous community like, i'm just wondering mm. what your thoughts are. i mean you might not have an well, answer it's a well, process let's but. just think on my feet for that to happen non-indigenous people will also have had to reframe their reality in their world for indigenous people to get to a place where we weren't feeling constantly kind of being colonised and recolonised, something in terms of power has to have shifted. The paradigm has to have changed. And, and non-Indigenous people would have to think also that their reality has changed. And you might think here, oh, that's never going to happen. But actually in New Zealand, it is happening in some areas. Because as tribes have got major settlements you know, there was a huge earthquake in Christchurch and the local tribe has become a major player in post-earthquake development in Christchurch. And I remember visiting and the taxi driver who was not Māori, you know, he was an Englishman, he's, you know, he said to me, are you Ngai Tahu? And I said, no, I'm just visiting. Um, and he said, well, to me, they're the ones who should govern this place because after the earthquake, they were the ones who fed me. They were the ones who delivered food to my house. They were the ones who looked after me. And I just thought, you know, that's a kind of, it's a perception change. It's a kind of a change of viewpoint. It's a power shift uh, because the tribe is, does have resources and is moving. So I think, you never think that things are impossible. Why are we here as Indigenous people today? Is we never gave up a struggle. We never gave up an identity. We never gave up a claim. We never gave up a sense of purpose. So I just think, you know, you escalate that over time. You look at changes in our communities, you look at, in my context, the treaty settlements, all of those things, we are renegotiating some of these relationships. And that renegotiation will lead to change, has to. And it, you know, at some level it's going to be painful, changing your sense of power, who, you know, how that works is always going to do people's minds in. But it's, it will happen. Question? Yes. Hi. Um, uh, my question is more to do with um, being an emerging scholar. I am currently working on my master's thesis and um, being, I guess, enveloped within the history department at SFU, I'm like the token Indian. Uh, everybody comes, like, the so many things about colonization and being indigenous, a person of indigenous descent, um, that come up constantly in, as a student and as a TA. Um, I'm wondering if you could just go back to your days as, as a master's student, what advice would you have to give me and other indigenous students in academia on how to navigate um, foreign and what I experience is hostile waters and emerge with the skills that I need to continue as a scholar but also retain my traditional roots and ties. Okay, number one rule is you have to complete your qualification regardless. Um, and that's really important to focus on the end game, not get lost in the um, the journey along the way. And if, you're, if you are the only one, it is hard. Um, how did I survive? Um, as you might gather, naturally opinionated. And I don't really care what my classmates or colleagues thought either about what I was on about. I was really confident about the topics that I was dealing with. And I made good allies. 
um, great allies actually because they've been my ally, allies for life. Um, good friendships and you know I did, I did the work. That's the other thing. I did double the work actually because I read everything that I was told to read and then I read a whole lot of uh, texts that weren't on the reading list. And so I made sure that I was just on top of that kind of work. Did I have arguments with, um, you know, my peer group about Māori issues? Yeah. And, I mean, you know, I think that there's a name for it now, microaggressions. Something in the newspaper happens about, you know, a Māori beating up another Māori. I'm having a nice, quiet cup of co coffee and someone says, oh, gee, that was bad what's happening to your people the other day. You know, that happens constantly. Um, well, it happened constantly when I was a student, when I was a teacher. You know, I was the one Māori teacher in a large secondary school, girls' school. Go up for morning tea. Do you have morning tea in classroom, in schools? I have morning tea. You know, a teacher says to me, um, oh, your girls are smoking in the toilet. I'm going, what girls? Which girls? What, you know, like, what do you mean my girls? And it was like all the Māori girls were my girls uh, when they were naughty. And then one of them became ducks and suddenly she was our girl, not my girl. Uh, and that's just, those are the microaggressions of racism really and, that's, and we do put up with them and we have to learn strategies of how to just brush some of it off and how to deal with those ones that you might want to do it. My current strategy, and my staff know this now, is I do little email spurts. So maybe once every two months, I go into the office and I say to, the, to my staff, going, right, I've got about six emails, I'm gonna punch those out in the next 20 minutes and everyone dives for cover. Um, because I just, you know, I don't try and be nasty. I don't think you dish it back out to people. I just think sometimes you have to just outline what the issue is. And then the solution. Because people who do that don't actually have a solution either. Well, what's an alternative way for them to interact with you? What are some other topics they could talk about that may be more neutral? So you do have to be kind of really providing answers all the time for others. And that makes it a heavy burden, but finish. Time for one, one final question. Yes, please. You, you. <laughs> um, hi. Um, so when you were talking about um, courageous conversations on tough topics in order to develop a solid understanding and questions of is our identity going to be grounded in trauma and colonization and um, so cultural, full whole cultural understanding of the roles and responsibilities of men and women in a community and how they are interconnected and they're both equally important. So my question is because we are within a framework that is dominantly patriarchal and um, that, you know, there's, there's um, the Harper government has failed to um, do a national inquiry on the missing and murdered women, majority of which who are Aboriginal. My question to you would be, how can we change these, like in order for social change, how can we change the structures in order to create space to have these tough conversations in order to stop, stop what's happening to our women? Um, how do we create these social changes to um, have these tough conversations in order to have a, a full understanding in the society that we live in today for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people to empower those marginalized voices to be self-advocates and working together rather than help helping, right, and um, speaking for? Um, oh, you have to ask a hard question. So my natural instinct always is 
if it's really important, don't wait and think someone else is going to do it. But if you're a student, my advice is finish your degree first. <laughs> and if you're not a student and you're in a community, though that item is not something you can do alone. But when I talked about the um, political discourse and the Māori television example, young people organised that social media campaign and they were brilliant at it. You know, and I, I was just, some of us older ones were like despairing of thinking young people are just becoming conservative, me, me, me generation type um, people. And, you know, suddenly he was an example of young people being able to mobilise, use resources and have those conversations. I also know in our communities that sometimes, and this is the risky conversations to have, it is, but I can say we have had it in our communities, is to ask some very scary questions about what's the relationships between Indigenous men and non-Indigenous men? To what extent are Indigenous men implicated in what's happening to Indigenous women? What is the role of families and the sort of, and, and you know, the upbringing and treatment of daughters and granddaughters? What is the role of the leadership of a tribe in um, their own personal behaviour and personal conduct in relation to women? Now those are hard questions. A young woman in my community can't ask those but older women do, that's our role. Our role as older women is to ask the men all those hard questions because they can't run away. And, but they're sort of important to ask, you know, because sometimes the two, you know, they are implicated in what's happening to the women because our men copy non-Indigenous men you know, when you look, who are their sporting um, role models is often not our, not us. It's other men. And so those practices sometimes have to get called out. You know, when a choice is made to be silent and support the status quo or to support a woman, you know, why are they silent? Why is our leadership silent? And yeah, we've, we've had some interesting examples at home where, you know, the women have questioned the role of some elders because of their personal, well, because of domestic violence issues, if I put it like that. And, you know, what they're saying is if you're the leadership, you have no legitimacy. Don't, you know, you can't talk to us if you can't practice, you know, what we should be practicing. So those are really hard internal conversations and then there's the other matter of raising this bigger issue of missing and murdered Aboriginal women. Because I have to say, looking from afar in New Zealand, it's just like, I can't get my head around the numbers of missing and murdered women. I can't get my head around why nothing's happened. I, you know, I can't get around the scale of that across more than one province. You know, unless you've got one mass murderer out there um, who hasn't been on TV yet, something awful is happening. And um, that is a national conversation. But it is also one that has to be held inside communities. Because I, I don't think they're, uh, to me, they're, everything is interconnected. It's, and how we treasure our girls and our granddaughters from the time that they are conceived and born and how we raise them and honour them as a community, you know, that's what ultimately will protect them. It's how we collectively do that. Mm, so that, but finish your degree. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I have several concluding um, things to do. And the first is, as a very, very small token of our appreciation, Linda, I have a, a gift for you so that you will remember you. this trip. Yeah. And secondly, 
I would like to thank President Andrew Petter and all of those in involved with the President's Dream Colloquium. I thank Jock Monroe. I thank John Driver. I thank Dustin Rivers. I thank uh, Rudy Reimer. I thank Brian Egan. I thank Kristen Dobbin. And especially, I, I thank Gladys Wee um, and the iPinch Project for making all of this possible. I would add that this lecture and all of the other speakers in this Stream Colloquium series are available on the SFU video library page as well as on the iPinch Project website. And on the iPinch Project website, I'll throw in a plug, of course, you will find lots and lots and lots of other materials I think of interest. But to conclude, please join me again in thanking Professor Linda Smith.